Hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, I'm uh, an economist and econometrician who recently joined the LSE Department of Social Policy. But in my previous life, I was 17 years at the University of Essex at the Institute for Social and Economic Research, where, amongst other things, I was the director. But I, I was also um, the co-principal and investigator at some times of the British Household Panel Survey and the successor Understanding Society. So basically, I do data creation, what well, I had in my past life, and I do a lot of uh, longitudinal data analysis of a quantitative kind. Uh, but like Tom, I don't know much about social care. Incomes and labour markets has been my thing, but I've dabbled in, and I'll give you an example later on of, of sort of related things. Um, I'm going to talk about um, longitudinal data, as it says, and the subtitle is important. Um, I'm going to be talking about multi topic general purpose household surveys. Um, whereas Barbara is following me, who's going to talk about the birth cohort surveys. So just before we want to get going, I'd say, as, and as we shall see, there are um, two main types of longitudinal data. I'm just going to make a distinction between these household panel surveys and cohort surveys. Uh, uh, so I agree, agree with Tom's statement about the UK being uh, a, a world leader in terms of longitudinal data, longitudinal resources. But I disagree with him about the birth cohorts being the crown jewels, or at least the only crown jewels. There are, um, in this royalist weekend to come, we can say that there are <laughs> heaps of crown jewels out there, I agree. and uh, household panel surveys, which the ESRC is putting huge amounts of dosh into, are um, also big in this front. So, longitudinal data. I'm going to be talking about sort of general stuff about longitudinal data, and excuse me if I'm telling you how to suck eggs, but I'm not sure where to start in this, and move towards the end, um, towards some examples. So just to be clear, longitudinal data is sometimes, if you, if you were in bio, biomedical statistics, you would refer to as repeated measures. Essentially, um, what you're doing is following people, or it could be other institutions like firms, uh, uh, you're following them and collecting data from the same units, the same people, over time. So it's like a movie, you're following over time. This should be, you contrast with the most commonly uh, used alternative for, for tracking over time, which is repeated cross-section data, which is where you follow, over, go over time, but you collect data from different sets of people. So an example of the, the poverty statistics that come out every year in the Family Resources Survey, that the Family Resources Survey is essentially a survey that collects data from different sets of people last year from the set of people who are surveyed this year. Longitudinal data, you take a group of people and follow them over time. The same people, repeatedly. Okay, so for example, if you wanted to study um, income changes associated with changes in an individual's disability status, and this is the example I'll consider later on, doing it with longitudinal data, you take a, a, a sample of people, for example, who move from being non-disabled to disabled and look at what's happening to their income and other sorts of characteristics. So the focus is on the, the, uh, tracking the same set of people over time. This is not the same as doing it with repeated cross-section data where you might have the average income of the people, all the people who are not disabled in one year, and you compare that with the incomes of people who, who are um, disabled in the same or some later year. So there's this really key basic difference. So I'm going to talk about basically about the rationales for longitudinal data and research, give you an introduction to design, but won't say much about cohorts, that's my successor's discussion, and then focus on household panels. Do stop me at any time, otherwise I'll just grab it on. Uh, okay, so why, why might you think about uh, using longitudinal data? Lots of reasons, um, and people draw upon various ones in different contexts. The first one, several are very descriptive ones, just in a sense learning more about how the, how the world is before trying to understand it and, and do something about it. Um, people talk about the differences between net change and gross change. Basically it's saying cross-sectional rates of something, so the proportion of people who are unemployed in this year and last year, doesn't tell you anything about who's moving into or out of unemployment or disability status or whatever. So uh, net changes are basically what you see are the rates uh, in any given year. Uh, net cha uh, gross change is telling also about the flows. So 
And the advantage about the flows is, of course, once you've got the flows, you can also work out what's happening to the proportions. So that's the first bit. The second thing is that um, many aspects that we're interested of, of about life are actually defined in an inherently longitudinal sense. So an example might be poverty persistence. So how long are people poor? You know, stuck, whether people are stuck in poverty or welfare dependence, to take a more topical example. You know, the, the notion of dependence is something that you know, requires time, the process of unfolding of time, for, for to actually define the concept, unlike an unemployment rate in a particular year or a particular point in time, which is inherently cross-sectional. Uh, and if, so just to, and then you can expand that, you can, with longitudinal data, you can take spell-based perspectives. You can not just say how much or how many at a particular point in time. You can say, take a people in a particular state and see how long they're in there and what are the factors associated with entry, factors associated with exit, and how that relates to how long they've been in the state. Um, then moving on to understanding and trying to model these things, um, one of the advantages of longitudinal data is that the fact is that you've got repeated observations on the same individuals. And that allows you, in a, in a broad sense, to allow to, to control for unobserved differences. So there is stuff that you don't know about people. You may have a very rich set of characteristics in, in these longitudinal data sets, but there's some things you may never actually manage to measure either because it's unobservable or because it's unobserved. But essentially, over time, you can, if, if those, those things are fixed over time, um, then you can difference them out by taking the repeated, uh, using the repeated observations. And if you're familiar with these sort of things, I'm talking about what economists would refer to as fixed or random effects uh, models. So this is getting us closer and closer to causal models of understanding. And of course, the fact of pure fact of having longitudinal data, you've got temporal ordering, and that helps as well in terms of the causal stories. So there are lots of uh, different sorts of um, data and designs out there. Um, I'm going to be talking most, mostly about surveys and fact panels, and I'll explain what I mean by that shortly. But um, in the medical uh, area, randomized control, random control trials are a form of longitudinal data design. They're much, much more focused in their purposes than what I'm going to be telling you about. But then essentially, they're following the same sort of, the same set of people, set of people over time, and it's essentially a control group and a treatment group, and looking at the differences between them. But they're essentially longitudinal data. But surveys aren't the only way to go. You could also have administrative record data where you link the records together. So for example, you might go to the Department for Work and Pensions and link to get together earnings histories. Um, for example, there's natural, national insurance contribution records. Um, you might link together um, education records through the um, pupil level annual school census, etc., etc. These are These are great, you know, wonderful, big data sets, but they're often created for bureaucratic purposes, running the benefit system, running the, um, and so on. Um, so they're not always perfect. They've got this comp comprehensive coverage of, you know, for, for what they were designed to do, and it's often said that measurement error is relatively low because this is the story, basically. But on the other hand, are we all using them? No, we're not in the Nordic countries. Um, Britain, uh, like uh, a number of other countries, uh, is very concerned about confidentiality, privacy, you know, and uh, access, uh, basically, and wants to control access for, for some good reasons, some bad reasons. Um, so, you know, these are not so widely widely used, um, but they are increasingly being used. There's some users being used in, in secure environments for two two things. Well, they've always been used as the um, sample frame for surveys. Um, so I won't say much about that, but increasingly, and I'll refer to this later, administrative record linkage of various kinds is being used to provide additional data for surveys. And I might, I might mention an example later, but probably well as well in terms of the, the um, cohorts. So um, let's now talk about um, longitudinal survey designs. And I'm going to sort of hone in on panel surveys and getting there. But first I want to make a distinction between prospective and retrospective designs. Distinction between prospective ones and retrospective is how you, how you get the data. Essentially, 
in prospect design, prospective designs, the data collection is taken from now, you draw a sample, and then you follow them from now into the future. And so essentially you have an interview or some other data collection process now, and then you get the next set of data next year, and the year after that, or if it's a monthly data collection, month by month. You know what now what's coming for retrospective data collection, you do one big data collection now, and then you look backwards, and if it's a survey, you ask respondents about what they were doing last year or the year before, and so on, build up histories looking backwards. Okay, so there are two ways of doing it. Um, both have been used a lot in Britain. And you can compare them in, in various ways. Um, and on this slide, I've got in the left-hand column a series of uh, headings that sometimes under which they're, they're compared and then comparing the two designs. So for example, uh, an important thing is actually to get hold of the data and uh, be able to adapt over time to new research issues. The advantage of retrospective designs is that they're really quick. You're doing it once and you collect all the data going backwards uh, at one time. Prospective survey is by definition slower because we have to do our sample now, wait till next year, the year after, and so on. So basically you have to be patient. And I can tell you that's an issue with co -fund, uh, with you know, getting funders involved in, in these sort of things. Cost uh, associated with what I've just been telling you about. Other things being equal, prospect of design can, can be often costlier simply because you have to maintain the sample, track them over time, and so on. Uh, narrative consistency. This is where I'm referring to uh, longitudinal history data. We want to collect it. If you ask somebody in a retrospective survey what you were doing at particular times in their life, you can set up various calendars and so on, and in a sense force people to reconcile their stories while you've got them there in front of you. Now, that's not quite so easy in a prospective design, simply because you don't see, you know, it's a year before you, or, or six months before you come back to the same people. So getting people's stories consistent is a bit more complicated. Uh, of course, then there is potential issues about bias. Recall bias is an issue that's often raised in terms of retrospective surveys. Uh, ask yourself how much you earned last year. Got a good idea? Well, you've probably got a rough idea. How about the year before that? Uh, even worse. Uh, you might be able to refer to a tax form if you know about that. What about your kids' birthdays, however? Probably know about that. Okay, so uh, in t depending on what you're actually, the sort of issues in people's lives that you're interested about, um, the re the re these retrospective designs may be more or less reliable. Um, but it's because we're interested in things like earnings and details of employment and so on, that is why we typically rely on um, prospective designs so we get this uh, repeated, repeated measurement and so on and you know, not relying on, on recall. So for things like hatches, matches and dispatches and histories of those over people's lives, also um, broad occupational histories, retrospective surveys might be okay, but for many other things, prospective designs are basically the way to go. There's also issues about non-response. Um, retrospective surveys have this issue about survival bias. If you take a survey now, for example, of old people and want to ask older people and want to ask them about what they were doing in their working lives, the people you have in front of you, say age 60 and over, are the people who have survived that particular point of view. Those people who are less healthy might, um, and so on may not literally be alive, or there may be other characteristics that make them less willing to uh, participate in surveys. On the other side of the coin, prospective designs have the potential issue of attrition bias, or other, might otherwise known as sample dropout or loss to follow-up. And that's an issue, you can do something about it, uh, but it is also an issue. So essentially you have horses for courses, that's the bottom line. The choice of design is dependent on your research goals and focus. I'm now going to focus on prospective designs, which are panel surveys, or, or the example being panel surveys. And this is where you essentially follow a group of people over time. You have sequences of interviews. These are often called waves, though Barbara's going to call them sweeps, I suspect, because that's the, what the cohort uh, people tend to, tend to refer to them. Same thing, same thing, it's a round of interviews or data collection. And there's lots of variation here. Certainly in terms of uh, these panels, there's a distinction between an indefinite life survey and a, and a fixed life one. Basically, uh, a, um, 
you can have a single panel, a group of people starting off, and essentially you're going to follow them in indefinitely. Well, indefinitely typically means at least as far as we can and as long as we get funded to do so. Uh, or alternatively, you, there are some rotating panels, which is where you take multiple overlapping panels where you're going to follow people for a fixed amount of time in advance. And, uh, the main example of that in Britain is the, the Labour Force survey, where there are quarterly interviews with a group of people, but in each quarter there is a, a new sample starting. People are followed for, for five sweeps, five ways each quarter, but there's an overlapping sample. So at any given quarter, you have a very big cross-sectional um, sample, which is built out of overlapping cohorts. Um, the other distinction is about the sampling units and the population which the survey aims to represent. And a big distinction here is whether the focus is entirely at the individual level or on individuals within their household context. And I'm essentially going to talk about in more detail about individuals within their household context, by we're talking about in the focus essentially being um, following individuals. Um, it's to do with ha how you follow people over time, which people you follow over time, and how you, whether or not you um, replenish the sample with new members. And of course, there's uh, lots of you can classify the surveys according to the sorts of information that you collect. Although I made this distinction between retrospective and prospective designs earlier, in fact, most household panels, and including ones I'm going to talk about later, also have long um, retrospective aspects in there as well. Basically, it's because A, these thing, you know, things like work histories and so on are of intrinsic importance, and I can tell you that it's also a way of having longitudinal data quickly so you can deliver some longitudinal information to funders. It may sound... Uh, uh, you know, a bit of a, a joke, but it's true. Okay, examples of panel surveys. I won't talk about birth cohort surveys, but there are the, the, the cohort surveys, but I just point out that there are not only birth cohort surveys, but there are surveys of young people. There are also surveys of older people that are, are, are around there, um, particularly important. And just to remind you too, that it's not just the social sciences, and there's also lots of... Um, other social experiments out there, and increasingly in Britain, program evaluations of things like uh, the New Deal for Low Parents, um, Sure Start. These are, there are evaluations of these have been based on um, cohort designs, where, where the, the focus is on the individual. Rotating and, and perpetual panel surveys, on the other hand, are following individuals in their house, household context. I've mentioned the Labour Force survey, uh, and I'm going to talk about now a perpetual designs, these household panel surveys. Um, essentially, they're uh, designed in a particular way to maintain representativeness of the sample population over an extended period of time. In, mostly, they, these are interested in the private household population of a particular country, so individuals who constitute the private household population. So, I have to say straight up, that misses out the very small fraction of the population who are homeless, for example because they're not in the private household population. And it also means some, some institutions are missed out. Um, and the idea is to maintain, through the, the, the design, which is not just how you choose the initial sample, but also how you follow people over time, to maintain representativeness of that group over time. There are substantial issues here, however, um, that have uh, reared their heads. So for example, in the original panel surveys in both the US Germany, and the UK, what you ask yourself, what happens if there's substantial immigration into a country over a period of time? So, for example, take the, in, in Britain, the survey I'm going to talk about later, the British Household Panel Survey, was um, sample was drawn in 1991, then subsequently a lot of immigration into Britain. So the same was the case for the German Household Panel that started in 1984. And if you want to say something about what's going on in the private household population, the trouble is it's changed over time. So what do you do about it? Well, in the short, in the short term, there's often a lot that you can do about it, and that's a particular problem. But the thing that people have done, and have done both in Britain and uh, in, in Germany, is to take refreshment samples. So basically you take a new sample and meld it onto the original one and follow them over time. So here's a big long list of longitudinal surveys. Uh, the granddaddy of them all is the panel study of income dynamics that started in 1968 in, in the US. There were then a series of um, 
smaller studies around uh, Europe, both in the Netherlands, Sweden, Germany, all starting in 1990, uh, early 1990s. The German panel, CERP, is the longest running one, study in 1984, still going. British Council Panel Survey, which we're going to talk about. There are subsequent surveys based on basically the German design and the British Council Panel design. Canada, Australia, New Zealand, European Community Household Panel, which um, what ran from for eight years from um, from the middle of the 90s to 2001 for the old 15 member um, member states of the EU. There is now um, the EU statistics on income and living conditions, which uh, is one component of it, has a four-year rotating panel in it, and there are various others, including all around the world. Um, Indonesia, Korea, South Africa, and so on. So um, household panels are a big thing um, all around the world. Um, and there are, of course, some heterogeneity in what's uh, going on. So, you know, for example, in the, the panel study of income dynamics, um, the data collection was all done uh, by, it well, still is, by a household reference person. Um, so one person is responding to give, provide information about everybody within the household. So, do all husbands know what their wives earn, and vice versa? Ask yourself. Um, so, differences, key innovations in the German and the British panels are that all adults, or all people 16 and over, are asked themselves, as well as a household respondent. More about that later. So, this is BHPS. This is the, um, you know, the big daddy of household panel surveys in, in Britain. Began in 1991. Um, has a uh, with a sample of around five and a half thousand households, um, covering ten thousand adults and around fourteen thousand altogether. There, because when you're adding kids, there were so there were just uh, just under fourteen thousand individuals for whom data was collected. So the sample frame we want to get hold of private household population, uh, po po private household population. So like ma major surveys of Britain, the postal address file is used for the sampling frame. Um, and then there are various uh, design aspects. It uses a clustered and stratified sample for both efficiency in um, basically data collection and some subsequent inference. Um, it's essentially an equal probability sample. If you're interested in that, we can come back to that and talk about that later. And as I said before, interviews are with all adult members who are age 16 and above of these original households. And then these people are followed over time and re-interviewed. Then it was done in the section in the autumn of every year. So September, October was where the, the interviews were co concentrated and for various reasons would sometimes be a, a bit longer. But this was an indef indefinite life uh, panel. Um, but indefinite meant, in fact, running for 18 waves through to autumn 2008. And I'll tell you what happened after that shortly. Uh, following rules, so we want to maintain the representativeness of the private household population, so how do we do it? So basically, you get the pat, you, you, you follow people within the survey in the same way in which the, po the population reproduces itself. So immigration aside, how does the po population reproduce itself or die? Basically, it has kids, kids to turn into adults. So what happens in the survey is that when the, the kids who were in the, below 16, they turn 16, they start getting interviewed in their own right. We're following people over time, so if a household splits up, husband and wife splits and go different directions, each of, the, each of the, those individuals are followed and interviewed in their own right. So the process of mobility in a ge geographic and other sort, in a, in a sort of life course sense, is mimicked with the, the sample design, the so-called following rules. Um, of course, uh, uh, so that, that gives essentially the way in which the uh, Sample design replicates the, the pa household population out there. Um, people are moving, yes. Uh, one key uh, thing that may be particularly important for um, social care application, applications is the difficulty of um, what happens if people go into institutions and so on. So this, this might be care homes, but it also might be prisons and so on. Um, this, this in BH, so beginnings of the BHPS is an example of where the sample members have gone out of scope. So some data collection is done for them, but um, there's a limit to what you can do. Similarly, if people migrate out of the country, or similarly, if they die. I mean, clearly you can't follow them. Um, I say that 
it's not entirely a, only a joke or a bad joke, but it, the point is that you can actually c collect quite a lot of information from the Ministry of Record, the registration data about people who have died, so you can link that information in. So there is some stuff that you can, that you can say. There are issues, of course, that the, the sample is reduced by attrition that I told you about before, um, people becoming ineligible. But that doesn't mean everything is uh, hopeless. Um, sampling weights are provided by the organisers of the survey to make some adjustment for these sort of things. The sample has developed over time. I said there were around 1,400 at the beginning. Um, but by wave nine, there were almost 20,000 associated with the sample because of the processes that I would tell you about. Um, and then with these, in fact, there were, were additional samples. So here's an exa another example with the BHPS about how you adapt to change over time and, and uh, new, new interests. Of course, we know during the 90s, particular interest in devolution in Britain uh, and associated with that, there were a series of new samples added on to the BHPS. So around 1997 and thereafter for Scotland and, and Wales and then Northern Ireland said, I want to be in too, and they were. Okay, so that basically means that there, you know, there are now larger uh, samples for these particular groups and you can do some um, uh, regional breakdowns. You might wonder about response rates. Well, the response rates at the beginning of the, of the BHPS correspond quite well with the same general purpose surveys that are around at the time. So for example, the family expenditure survey, what is now the family resources survey, and so on. So around two thirds of, of eligible households have give complete interviews, more if you take in, into account incomplete interviews, uh, and, and so on. But what happens going on there, thereafter? Like most longitudinal surveys, um, you lose the most at the beginning. So you lose just over 10% 10, 10 uh, in the first year. But the wave and wave response rate thereafter through to around wave, wave 18 is only about 5% a year. So re response is pretty damn good in, in this case. There is, of course, uh, people don't provide perfect information or complete information in every way. There is an issue of non-response. It varies a lot depending on what you're asking people about. If you ask them what, what their age and sex is, you get pretty reliable information. If you ask them what their income is, particularly if they're self-employed, less reliable, um, and also people may give just simply either not know or be less willing to give a response. Um, so there is stuff in that provided by the, the data producers, imputed values and so on. So it's not entirely hopeless. Data are collected in lots of different ways. Essentially there's an interview, but there is information collected about the household is, itself, because remember we're interested in the household context. So there is a household question, there are individual questions, self-completion questions about attitudes and values, uh, and so on. There's, and there's actually a young people's questionnaire for those aged age 11 to 15. Um, and, and corresponding to each of these questions, there's essentially a short interview, 10 to 15 minutes, with a household reference person collecting stuff about the household as a whole and, and, and their housing. It, each ad, adult respondent uh, provides information and kids and so on. So, personal interviews, it started off using pen and paper, compu uh, computer assisted stuff was added later on. Okay, this is, um, this is why the survey is not uh, a, a, a focused on social care. Basically, it is, does uh, lots of things, covers lots of topics, lots of purposes, covers everything from demography of individuals and households, education and training, health and caring, labor and force participation, attitudes and values, income and wealth, housing and consumption. And the good thing about it is, it's not just that it has information about each of them, is that you, but you can look at these life course events in parallel at the same time. And that's, the, that's the whole point. I'll skip that. Uh, I'll skip that. I'll skip that. Okay, so uh, here's information about we can get loads more documentation and stuff, and you'll, you'll see this in the slides that get left behind uh, today. There's the extra data. Okay, so understanding society. BHPS had basically run its course by the end of the 1980s to some dissatisfaction with issues of the sort that I was talking about. Couldn't cover um, immigration uh, issues, couldn't cover ethnic minorities and other small groups and so on. So essentially a, a big new opportunity came along um, to have a, a, a new survey. And this is Understanding Society. Terrible name, but that's what it is. Um, uh, 
Basically, it's very big, and it also incorporates the BHPS. It started interviews in 2009. It's run from the same place as the BHPS. It got money from the Large Facilities Capital Fund, which is essentially a big science fund that usually buys telescopes, Arctic research ships, and things like that. But somebody had an inspired idea to fund social science survey. It's a resource, after all. Funding also comes from ESRC and government department co-funders, and the whole idea is to expand the scope, be much more ambitious. Uh, and it's the largest single investment in academic social research. So bigger than any of the both cohorts so, so far, but may not be as big as the, the next both, both cohorts. Ever. So to give you an idea, large numbers. 100,000 individuals in 40,000 households. OK, so that's, um, depending on how you do it, um, you know, about three times bigger than the BHPS. Um, lots of different samples. General purpose sample, there's an ethnic minority booth sample, um, there's an innovation panel for methodological work, and the HPS sample is tracked along. So there is now, the Wave 19 of BHPS is now in understanding society. So if you've got many uh, sample numbers, you can look at small size groups in great interest. Uh, disabled people, regional and uh, sub-regional variation, particular events, and so on. New content, as I said, uh, ethnic minorities. Biomedical data is now included, in including physical measures. So um, instead of just asking people how, how tall they are and how heavy they are, they're actually, there are physical measures, uh, and uh, fluids are taken. Um, so DNA is being collected by blood. Um, for various groups, state administrative record linkage of various kinds, education, health and hospital uh, records, income taxes and benefits uh, to come, um, overcoming various uh, issues that have to be done. And of course, geocoded linkage is possible on multiple geographies. So you can see that it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, yeah, so basically the, the survey has just started, so there aren't any longitudinal uh, data yet available. It's this, the survey is so big that instead of the field work being done just in the autumn, it's spread out over not just one year, but over two years. So there are basically 24 monthly samples. So that the waves you know, carry up annually, annual data collection as for the BHPS, but there are overlaps in the different waves. Some of the data are available. So household panels have done lots of stuff. Um, this is just some of the ISA books um, that, have, that have come out, and there are thousands of articles by ISA people and others. Um, and uh, I could talk about my example on disability and disadvantage, but I've overrun, haven't I, Tom? I think you should. I yeah, think so, we should so, so we should start. start. I, but I, I perhaps leave that up so yeah. people can, can take yeah. the, I'll, I'll just, the reference. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll just give you. Well, they'll get the copy of the slide. But I think just to give people a chance before they get another sure. note from Barbara. To, okay. to just, I'll just give two minutes, two, one second on the context. What do we know about disability in Britain? Virtually all have been derived from cross-sectional data. And so to go back to my initial um, slide about saying the, how disadvantaged were disabled people in Britain compared to non-disabled people all from cross-sectional data, nothing about movements into disability, how long people stay there and so on. So this is just a, an early piece of work using BHPS, very descriptive, but making a key distinction between disadvantage associated with pre-existing circumstances and showing that the people who became disabled were typically um, overrepresented from the, uh, uh, well, tend, tended to be disadvantaged before they started. And then looking at what happened uh, the longer people remained uh, disabled, what happened to um, to their to their conditions in, in income and employment? Anyway, that's enough of me. Great, thanks. Sorry for well, going. Just on. yes, so people can get it's journal social policy two thousand four. Yes, but they'll get the slides. They'll get they'll get the slides. Right, brilliant. Thanks, Ian, for seeing that wonderful uh, overview. Rap, catch your breath a bit for five or ten minutes, but chance to ask. Um, Questions and I think I should emphasise that you know, the questions can be at any level of sophistication or, or non-sophistication. So don't feel uh, afraid about that. And I'll just wash my mouth out with soap. And it, it, uh, uh, I stand completely corrected. All I can say is that in our report, the ONS, which we're presenting tomorrow, number one conclusion is use understanding society as the main vehicle for measuring well-being. So Great. <laughs> Any any questions or or just responses? Um, the slides will be circulated. Not. <coughs>
So I make uh, two comments. Firstly, thank you very much, Steve, for a very good presentation. Secondly, I've never previously heard the expression hatches, matches, and dispatches, but I love it. Um, and thirdly, I just want to sort of throw the, the discussion up to other people, because I know some people in the room have used BHPS to, or have looked at BHPS as a possible, and maybe in the society as a possible vehicle for social care research. And I just wonder whether you know, they might want to comment on the suitability, you know, how useful they found that. So people that have got, I mean, Raphael probably knows a bit, but I don't want to put people on the spot, but if there are people that have got some experience of that, it would be helpful just to have your thoughts to log back to Stephen. Nobody wants to, no, okay. Because you've been in your questions that there's health and caring is included in the dimension. Uh, and that sort of alerted me to the possibility that there might be some yeah. social yeah. care. Related. I guess it would depend what you think, it, what counts as social care, and I've been thought about that. It's a, I mean, it's certainly if you were wanting to look at people in the in, in, in an institutional context, it would not be particularly good for us. But there is a lot about caring. I mean, because everybody in the household is asked about caring and whether or not they're caring for people. And you can put that along, and people have done work on how that interacts with labor force behavior and so on. The development of you know, caring histories, and it's not just child care, it's care for anybody. Um, uh, health conditions, there is lots, I mean a lot of, it, it, in the BHPS there is not a lot, there is not a lot of, there's no physical data collection in, this, in the biomedical sense. There, you know, there's not a nurse visit as there is in understanding society and getting out the equivalent of tape measures and, and uh, other sorts of things. Um, but there's a lot, yeah, there's a lot of health conditions, there's stuff about uh, health service usage, attitudes and values to uh, different sorts of services. And of course, you can put it together with you know, everything about you know, where they live, who they live with, uh, their um, work and occupational histories, and so on. Um, so I guess it, it, it'd be easy to answer the question if I know what, what sort of uh, questions people are interested in. Um, one of the areas is that I would be interested in data on things like receipt of home care, attendance at uh, day centres, or nowadays in the world of personalisation, I guess, receipt of personal budgets and direct payments. Yeah. I attended, I think, to his answer maybe, maybe more most recently, the Nelson's, says, you know, way five, actually not just uh, way six, really, I should have said, but gradually building up the ways it's collected more variables on use of social care from wave six is quite a lot for it. Yeah. Is, uh, so I'm uh, about to do with that the study side. Has that got more in it than the BHPS did? Or other on different groups? sorts of payments? On, on both oh. receipt of different types of community based care and on other case for it as well, actually. I have to say, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, there was a lot I, the, in the BHPS that has uh, collected information on incomes coming from uh, up to 39 different sources. You know, to that, and part of that is because Britain's got such a really complicated benefit system. And that includes disability benefits of various, of various kinds um, uh, and so on. And, and, we're, and understanding will be adapt, you know, take into account the changes in legislation and so on. But as to, as for, and, and of course takes into account so-called private transfers between individuals paying, you know, both and also payments out as much as, uh, um, but to be honest, I don't know the precise answer. What you know, who is going who is going to uh, sorry I can't help I don't know the exact question. But the the website I think will will have it. There's not an individual attached to each of those headings in the so How do you think? Well I mean education and training or health and caring or Oh yeah, no, everybody, each individual because the, the whole No, sorry, I meant I meant within the the uh, BHPS team or the Understanding Society team. Is there any? Is there an individual? Uh, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't. No, work. I mean, the, I suppose it does uh, in a in a rough sort of rough sort of way. But there's not a if you if you want to know about health, ring X. Uh, yeah, broadly speaking, I mean, ring a man a second. Who you know, or Yvonne Kelly. Just a very basic question. Um, you know, from what time onwards do you actually call something a longitudinal study? I mean, like how long does it have to be? Two years. Repeated observations? Two you get repeats after. Even with every year? Yeah. 
I mean, a lot of young students are classical, so all you need is you know, them being in one class in a school at one point and the next class at another point, so much less than a year. I mean, obviously, if you're, uh, it probably depends what you're interested in doing. Well, if you're only looking at a transition at a particular point in time, you know, you only need two observations. Of course. I mean, if, but if you want to be more ambitious about doing things like controlling from unobserved differences, the more that you observe the people over, people over time, the more that their behaviour will reveal what what that unobserved thing is that you know um, that might be affecting behaviour. Can I ask one more question? Sure. Um, for developing countries, I mean, like if you would actually think of applying household surveys in South Africa, as you said, like that has been done, you would almost, I mean, has it been used to almost manipulate policy in a way because you would miss all the townships or the population? I mean, probably you would miss a huge. Well, um, I have to be careful because I'm not an expert on this, but the, um, South, uh, the, the South African survey to which I'm referring is, I'm sure it, it's done its best in terms of population coverage. Um, including, you know, I mean, issues of sort of what you count as a home or a homelessness, it clearly becomes more important, and in a society which in which there's a huge amount of my internal migration becomes an issue for following rules. But I mean, the, the survey people know this, and so there, and, and a lot of these flows are seasonal, so the, the, there's something you can do about it. And and there are then you also use um, innovative. Uh, well, you adapt the design to try and take account of this by you know, relying on other people in the household to say where other people have gone. I mean, you can't run exactly the same design everywhere. I mean, just simply there are natural. But there's, and some of the original um, South African survey, in fact, focused on particular geographical areas. So there's, um, uh, I can't remember the exact name, KwaZulu, KwaZulu Natal, somewhere in a particular. You know, Geographic focus. The Indonesian survey is, is a national one, for example, um, following the household over time. What the developing country longitudinal surveys typically haven't followed um, individuals. They haven't used the same following rule. They've, they've tried to follow households reflecting a different sort of um, design. I mean, I think it's problematic, and it's, the, the development literature has pointed to this because, you know, if you're at, there's no so, one of the slides I didn't show you was to say that there is basically the message is there's no such thing as a longitudinal household. You can't you can only follow individuals over time and look at their household context. Why can't you follow households over time? Because there's no such thing as a step, you know, in general, as a stable household. People households come to, people come together into households, households split. So you can't just sort of define a set of households in your initial sample and follow household one over household over time to wait year two, year three, because there's no such thing. You can follow the individuals who were in the original household. And that's so what that's basically the following of these designs. Thanks. Next one. Uh, Sorry, I no, it was in between it's actually the lady green. Thank you. <laughs> um, apparently you do have something in there about contacts with some services um, like social work. And it obviously it was very low percentage but potentially, could, could you use that data? To, could you control for enough things that you could look at something to do you with could, that? With caution, with caution. I mean, uh, if you have a look at this article, you can see the, that the actual numbers of disabled people in, in, the, in the BHPS is relatively small. Um, so even pooling over the first eight waves, we're looking at several hundred. So that's going to limit what you can do. And that's why I understand one of the reasons for having understanding society is that by having such a huge sample, you know, you're going to try and guarantee that you have uh, at least some minimum you know, cell sizes for um, particular pop population groups of interest. And do you know if those questions about service contact, they will be in understanding society as well? Uh, my guess is yes, but I'd better not say uh, yes, but I'm 100% confident. Is that easy to get, or the, the, which variables you've asked? Is that all if you just go to, um, uh, well, the two routes to getting there, go to understanding.org.uk, the website and look under documentation or heading or go directly to the UK Data Archive, esds.ac.uk and have a look at the catalogues and all the documentation is also there and it's in five minutes you could tell us what, what variables are there. Hi, um, just a couple of questions. It relates back to just something you said I found quite interesting. You said that you couldn't follow a household over time necessarily. Are you therefore really 
measuring the families or family connections over time, not necessarily blood families, but families. Oh, all sorts. All so, so in a sense, um, you're not necessarily following individuals over time, but families and what happens to those No, no, literally following individuals, because those, because, um, there's only you can only consistently follow individuals because it, you know, so you're not really looking at the connections. Well, you can, of course you can, because that's by the, by the design, uh, and it's unlike a cohort design where there's just basically one target individual within the household. You you've got everybody within the original sample is of interest. So you know if a couple uh, splits, you follow each of them into their new context. But because it with the accumulation of data over time. You can always, you know, look at the amazing complexities of people's okay, lives. So people, kids, kids who grow up and leave home, are followed into their new arrangements. They're students, and if they stay with the sample, into jobs and so on. Uh, and, and if they marry, yeah. uh, so if somebody joins them in a new household, their new partner is uh, also interviewed, and we get information about them. If they have a kid, that kid becomes part of the sample. And you know, and so on, and so on. It reproduces. So, it is really about you know the household context and uh, the relation. There is very detailed information about ha um, family and household demographies. There's a wonderful file called the Alt Ego file, which tells you the relationship in each household, for example, of everybody to everybody else. So you're actually looking at social networks as well. Okay, that's fine. Well, within households and families. Not social networks in the Not sense networks. of local communities mm -hmm. and other sorts of things. Though there are questions um, that have been used to look at these things, where people are asked who their best friends are, okay. three, be three best friends, and etc. And um, just with the new sort of super duper um, survey, you're looking at ethnic minorities, and how are you categorising those? Are you looking, at, you know, are you looking at every single different? Uh, good point. Um, in the, eth the ethnic minority boost sample, uh, focuses on uh, the five most, five, the five of, of greatest interest. And don't tell me to say exactly. Yes. exactly. <laughs> uh, uh, um, it, it, so. Uh, so the five greatest interest to who? Uh, well, the, the five <laughs> in terms of relative numbers and in terms of sub. So let me try this and see how many I get to. Um, so Afro Caribbean. Um, Chinese, um, uh, Indian, Bangladeshi, Black African. Is it white Pakistan? Hmm? Pakistan? Yeah, did I say that? Indian, yes, Pakistan, yeah. Bangladesh. Yeah, so Indian sub subcontinent and so on. So those are the main ones. That, but of course, um, in the main population sample, people's ethnicity is also collected. So there, are, I mean, there's basic. Uh, you know, so there's not only the white minor, majority, majority in the comparison, national comparison sample, but also other, you know, all sorts of minorities. The collection of lots of uh, in the boost sample, lots of collection about we, where people were born, particularly if it was outside the UK. In fact, where their grandparents were born, uh, and all sorts of details. So again, sort of social networks of a different kind. Okay. Right. Well, that's fine, and then we should move on to that. Just in relation to that, I was just wondering um, what sort of immigration status people needed to have to be part of the sample. Um, and if somebody was like, living with um, another person that um, was an illegal immigrant or something, um, would there be, was, is it sort of, is the person sort of right safeguarded there, or could them coming into contact with the survey sort of prove a liability? So you're, you're, there's two questions, uh, really, essentially. One is whether or not, uh, strictly, are they eligible people, so are illegal migrants eligible to be sampled in the sample design sense? Answer, yes. Uh, it, I mean, it's a sample of the UK have a private household population. So if they are living in a private household, when the interviewer shows up, you know, they're in. Okay, there are prob maybe sub problems subsequently in following them over time, trying to find them the next year, you know, because of their, their status now, that um, makes it difficult. They may have moved on for, for various reasons. The second question you ask is about if, is the ethical one about what you know, essentially data confidentiality, and there is a complete data confidentiality. This has nothing to do with the government, or you know, or no information is ever passed on to you know the, the whatever it's called the border force. Now, um, it's nothing to do with them. In the same way that. 
we've been, you know, been collecting for two decades information about people's incomes and earnings, and none of that ever goes near HMRC. I mean, it's those ethics issue. You know, this is it, the sample. The survey is introduced as a survey uh, run by the University of Essex, probably, and, and there, are, there are various ethics. You know, stuff that go with it. All the physical measure stuff that I refer to in and uh, and uh, collection of blood, etc., has been through the various relevant medi medical ethical committees and so on and so on. So ethics are really important to us. Okay, I think we'll have to move on. Thank you very yeah. much again, Steve. Can I just ask one question? How many people are employed in, this, in the survey, the data collection? Uh, it's difficult to uh, distinguish it because, that, um, because it's a large amount of money. BHK costs over a million a year to run. Um, that, that has to be contracted out, so it's done to a survey organisation. I don't know how many they use. Oh, Within ISA, well, that's really, it's quite yeah, hard. I, I meant more the day. Yeah. But put it another way, all these survey organisations think it's really good to have the... Uh, but either the code awards or the household panels on their CV. Yeah. It basically generates them business because they're property surveys. Okay, thank you, Stephen. <coughs>